my name is Mark Ray. I'm executive director of the Grace Center for Spiritual Development. And I want to start with a question here as we dive into this episode of the Grace Cafe. When you look throughout the history of biblical leaders, great biblical leaders from Scripture, you see over and over again, man after man after man after man. You see the Abrahams and the Davids and the Moses and the Elijahs and on and on and on. Rarely do you see a woman that rises to the level of leader, except for one in specific, and that would be Deborah. And there are a few other examples, but Deborah is one that really, really points out these characters of biblical leadership. Why would that be? Why is that the case? Why is there a woman? And what's the differences? Are there differences between leadership qualities in men and in women? My guest today, good friend of mine, Dr. Johnny Sego. She is a professor, conference speaker, teacher, author, head of the practice of parenting, which really deals with leadership and family, a wonderful, wonderful ministry. Um, she has sp spoken all around the world. She is uh, was one of our guest workshop speakers at the Karis Conference, our biblical leadership conference back in February. And she spoke on this topic of Deborah just recently at, at our extension site. Dr. Siegel, it is wonderful to see you. Great to have you back on. Thanks for being a part of this with us. Yes, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You bet. So let me let me start this with an overall question, and then we'll dive into kind of what I set the stage with. Um, why is Deborah such a significant leadership example for you? Why would you have chosen to teach on her? Well, um, you know, Mark, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I know the audience wants me to say it's because she's a woman. <laughs> and, and and because there are so few, as you pointed out, women of virtue that we can look to. Um, I mean, you know, Esther did her thing and saved her people, and that's cool. But not many of us really do grow up to be real life princesses. And so, you know, we're a little bit limited here. But honestly, here's here's where Deborah gets me. And I, I'm looking in Judges four four. It says that she is a prophetess and that she was judging Israel at the time as she used to sit under the palm tree and give her judgments. And, you know, I'll tell you about Deborah to me, why I was drawn to her is because I, um, when I started reading about Deborah and I really prayed and said, Lord, debunk all the myths to me about this woman. You know, in, in my mind as a little girl growing up in Sunday school, to me, Deborah was like an Amazonian, you know, she was seven feet tall, she had these big <laughs> muscles, you know, she was that kind of judge. And I mean, she was just like a better version of uh, Wonder Woman with no cape, you know? And so I was like, you know, Lord, I just know that's not it. So give it to me, give it to me straight. What What is it about Deborah, Lord, that you chose her to be this model? And there it is. She wasn't just a smart gal. She wasn't just wise. She was a prophetess, which of course means that she daily heard from the Lord and acted like this vessel where he would tell her how to judge and that it would go out from her. And she had her own tree where she went and sat. And then day after day, that's what she did. And people depended on her. As I said, you know, during our extension, People were depending on her to have spent time with the Lord to give these righteous judgments. And I was just overwhelmed. And I was like, Lord, that is the leader I want to be. I, I, you know, re regardless of my gender, I want people to say, she is going to give me the word of God. She's going to tell me what the Lord told her. And um, I think it's very brave, more than Amazonian, to be that kind of leader. But anyway, I just, I think everything else about her character flows from that. Well, and you just laid the platform. The platform is that type of leadership is not specific to gender. You Spending time with the Lord, you don't spend more time with the Lord if you're a man or a woman. David's proof of that. You don't spend more time because of your your bent. It is your commitment to being with the Lord. And male or female, you can do that. Um, that that's right. 
So, so let me let me dive a little bit deeper. In, in when you spoke on, when you taught on Deborah as a leader, you made a statement that really captured me. You made this statement: leaders follow virtues, not values. First of all, define for me the difference between virtue and value, and then why that why your statement applies, especially as, as it relates to Deborah. Well. Um... I'll be honest and tell you that um, I and I think I did this um, whenever we were together before that I gave credit to Jonathan Dodson yes. in Austin. Yeah, he's a pastor at City Life Church, and he's just recently written a book called Our Good Crisis, which is like, you know, how again, how prophetic that he wrote that book over a year ago. And here we are in a in crisis. A crisis. Yes. Right. And um, and so he's talking. Um, it, what he does is he goes through the Beatitudes. And so he gets to the Beatitude of blessed are the pure in spirit. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, I, I mean, you know, I'm reading a book, but it's like I'm in an auditorium and we get a collective. <gasps> what? You know, because he says today's contemporary society. We really want to talk about what are our core values? What are your governmental values? What are your personal values? And so we can say things like tolerance or um, inclusion or things like that. But he says, but when you go back to the pure in spirit, the pure in heart, that's more than a value. That's a virtue. Yes. You have to be a virtuous person. That means that you're not judging things according to society. Our society right now values tolerance. You know, just can't we all be happy together? Well, you know, we can all love one another. That's true. But we can't accept everything. That's not pure in spirit. That's not pure in heart. That's the virtue against the value. And boy, that to me, Mark, has been the hardest thing in my leadership role in 40 years. And that is, oh, you know, Lord, my culture, even my Christian culture says I need to value this, but your word is my virtue. Yes. And I think that, you know, that's the strong leader. And, and as you said, I, I Leadership is genderless to me. I, I talk about my dad all the time when I um, teach on leadership because he was my leadership model. And, um, you know, he there was never anything about, well, you know, if only you were a boy, you could be the first president of the United States. Or, you know, if, I, you know, if only you were blah, blah, blah. You know, it was always just you're a leader and you have to do it this way. So I just sort of grew up looking at that you know that this is what we're called to do well and you've just given us a second one in that virtues are not gender specific yeah. virtues are virtues it is and, and interesting enough i think the way you just framed it if i understood you correctly culture can have a very different set of values than than the virtue says um, and you're exactly right. Culture says this is okay. In fact, we even know from Romans chapter one that the longer you put God, the light of God behind bars, the more what we think is right is actually wrong. What we think is wrong is actually right. That's a that's a values type of judgment. But then it reverts back to a virtue of who will you stand behind? Will you lead from the biblical view or will you lead from the cultural view? Now you're into a values issue if I'm if I'm landing where you're where you're going. And and certainly Deborah, <laughs> let's talk about her for just a minute. Here she is in the world of men, and Deborah steps steps into the middle of that because God has called her to step into the middle of that and to render virtuous judgment. Exactly. And see, Mark, that that is really you can always tell in the life of a real biblical leader, there's the line. There's the line that said, oh, that would have been okay, but it wouldn't have been virtuous, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, you know, Moses could have stayed in Egypt, you know, but he had a bigger plan. He had to run because he had to be preparing for what God actually had 
for his righteous duty later on. So there is, here we are with Deborah, and Barack says, uh, I won't go unless you don't, unless you go. And I, as I said the other night, I think a lot of people give him a really bad rap for that, like he's some kind of coward. I think Barack is a really smart guy. And he saw the spirit of the Lord was with Deborah. And so just like Moses said, Lord, I'm not going to lead your people without you. That's exactly what Barack is saying here. He's like, I'll go up and fight, but I'm not going without you. And right. so then whenever she issues her judgment and she says, okay, big boy, but then a woman's going to get the glory. And notice she doesn't say, I'm going to get the glory, not you. She, I don't, the Lord has revealed it's not you, girlfriend. You're, you are who I'm speaking to. You're his covering. You're his shelter. But somebody else is going to do the deed, and it's not going to be you. And so that's why I'm just so taken with her is because that line of virtue is, I just love this, where she said she comes up this far and no more. You know, she doesn't chase that general. She's yeah. content with God's judgment. So humility is a virtue. Yes. We see that displayed, obviously, in Barack. We see it. We see it even displayed in Deborah. It is a virtue. We saw that displayed in abundance in Christ. We we see that as maybe the most significant key virtue there is the humility. But it's a humility in submission to not the culture, but it's a humility in submission to the Lord. Correct. That's correct. Um, in submission to the Spirit, right? right. And so again, we go back to those Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, and that's not the weak. And see how we've messed that up with poor Barack yes. again. We you know we called him weak, but no, he was meek. He understood that in this one situation, he wasn't being given the revelation. This mm -hmm. woman was. Yes. And so rather than bow up and get all proud about that, he just says, Hey, I, I can be number two. I will be your VP. Let's go in together and get this job done. And so he goes in, and of course, then, you know, he is the commander in the battle, and, you know, the rest is history. But um, I just think those virtues that we see in the New Testament, um, especially in Philippians, not considering someone, you know, not considering myself higher than I ought to think, but considering right. others than myself, and then especially in the Beatitudes, I take those virtues and I apply them to my own life, and they're timeless. You know, my dad um, reminded me, uh, again, I go back to him, and he reminded me of a time in uh, our, our United States history when it was a value to pray in school. Yes. And I grew, up, I grew up in that. And um, and he but he warned me, you know, he said there will be a time um, whenever you won't because I I was a leader then. And I stood every morning in our classroom and prayed with my Bible, my little, you know, white King James in my hand. Um, and I prayed for my class. And he said, there'll be a time whenever you won't do that. And he said, but don't worry. It's OK. He said, because mm. the United States will shift in its values, but you will never shift in your virtue. And so he said, no one will ever stop you from praying for your classmates. And so that's a, that's a, that's a huge difference between value and virtue. That's, that's a marvelous distinction. So we can see it's not our American value right now. Yes. But, but as Christian leaders, it better still be our virtue. You know, right. it better still be our daily practice. And so um, I think Great that point. that's, you know, we see, um, I mean, uh, all across our culture, you know, that uh, value, you know, there's a value on freedom. Mm -hmm. Well, that has certainly been shot out of the water during, you know, all of our quarantine and stay yes. at home and stay in place and that kind of thing. And so, like, I've had to talk to my grandchildren about, no, we're choosing to do this to keep for the safety of others. We're thinking of others more highly than ourselves. Don't get all bowed up and mad about this. You know, don't post crazy stuff on social media. Submit, <laughs> Romans 13, submit yes. to this authority and, and show our virtue. Yeah, that's great. You, let, me, let me 
shift the conversation just a little bit. There's another thing that you that you stated, which was this, um, that Deborah was willing and wise and listening to the Lord. So let me let me rephrase that statement just a little bit and ask you to speak to this. Does willingness to listen lead to wisdom? That's so good. That's so good, isn't it? I mean, the word would bear that out, you know, quick to listen, slow to speak, you know, Psalm 1, that tree planted by the water, that tree is not making a lot of noise. It is soaking in and yes. grows tall and strong. And so absolutely, I think, I think listening is a as a huge skill and i i actually it's funny i actually teach classes on listening in my leadership development classes that i teach and i always tell them this is the hardest thing you'll ever learn yes it it is very difficult well and i'll say it once again god also places leaders and we see this throughout the scripture he places them in situations in which they can do nothing else but listen david sitting in a cave day after day after day after day, you get Moses who sent out for how many years, 40 years out, just he in the, in the sheep, multiple situations, Christ himself sent out into the wilderness. Uh, we see Paul prior to his ministry, he comes to know the Lord and he sent out. There are time and time and time again where that, that maybe I should call it this way, the virtue of listening is what leads to and granted it depends on who you're listening to and in this particular case it was significant that deborah was listening to the lord which made her wise it was from listening to the lord that that wisdom came from right. speak to that just and a little bit more so think about paul in prison mm -hmm. you know oh, absolutely <laughs> I mean, uh, no, he didn't have to social distance. They took care of that for him, right? <laughs> so he had plenty of time to listen to the Lord. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the whole New Testament. And <clears throat> praise the Lord that he listened well, that he transcribed what the Lord was saying to him, that he gave us that instruction. Then we have, uh, we have John on the island of Patmos. And, you know, sure. if there wasn't that exile, if there wasn't that listening, we wouldn't even know what awaits us in heaven. Yes. And so just, you know, and I've just really been like trying to lean into this in this COVID-19 where I've really been trying to listen to the Lord and say, what is it? What unique message are you trying to give us? that there's no way we would get if it weren't for this time when we've been forced mm -hmm. to be still and listen. I'm not Elijah in a cave being fed by the ravens, but pretty close. <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. if it weren't for your delivery, I probably would be being fed by the ravens. And yet I, I will say just for myself, um, the Lord has revealed so many great things to me in these few in these few weeks that I've been home just because I've had so much time to listen. Mm -hmm. And I I just see that as such a virtue. And you, you know, said, there's, you know a, there's an interesting New Testament phrase when when Jesus comes down or when he's being transfigured. So he's in all of his glory, he is sitting there in all of his glory. And it's the second time we hear at the baptism we hear the word of the Father. In, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We hear that exact same phrase at the transfiguration. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then there's a second phrase that God says. Hear him. Listen to him. The interesting thing, I think, is that the disciples, Jesus comes down. The transfiguration is, occurs. It's finished. It's done. And as we kind of get back to normal, Jesus then turns to them and says, now, I'm going to head to Jerusalem. I'm going to be imprisoned. I'm going to be beaten and I'm going to be killed, but I will rise the third day. And the first thing they go is, no, that, that can't happen to you. So this listen to him, <laughs> now hear him, is thrown out the window because I, you know, for, for whatever reason, the disciples didn't want to hear, but didn't also hear all the way to the end of the story. 
this is going to happen, but the third dam going to rise again. So a huge, a, a huge um, virtue, I think, is just that principle of listening and especially listening to the Lord. We see this again over and over again in leader after leader after leader. Great, great point. Um, that's a great story there, Mark. Think about the value that Peter was placing there on that Mount of Transfiguration. <gasps> Let me build you a shelter. Let me build you a building. Let's just hang out here. I mean, and you know, that's a value we as church members have to really avoid. I love this holy huddle. Let's just hang out here forever. I let's just, let, let, you know, let's just enjoy this fellowship together. And, you know, and Jesus was like, not what I have in mind, you know, <laughs> listen here. And, but, but Peter is a value man. Oh, I value this. I value our fellowship and friendship. And Jesus is looking to the virtue of I'm going to die yes. for you. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great point. So again, staying with that. Um, and I make this statement, leaders listen decide and accomplish the task. That's kind of one of the, the, the things that you laid out in your notes. Leaders listen, decide, and accomplish the task. It, it begs the question in my mind, how can a leader then not become so task-oriented that they, that they uh, overlook the relationship? Because once the task is done, it's done, but the relationship is not. The relationship with the people you're leading, the relationship with those who are surrounding you that you're leading with and that you're leading over. How, how do you not become so focused on the task that you that you let go of the relationship? Does that, does that question make sense? Yeah, that's great. And so just to like reword that a little. So when I was talking and I was trying to show like Deborah was decisive as a leader, yes. which she heard from the Lord, then, you know, then she committed. We are going to do this. And so you have to do that. And that's really difficult as a leader because, um, you know, you get all these different voices, you get all this different input. And, you know, we, we always are drawn toward people pleasing and, oh, I don't want to make them mad. So maybe I'll just, you know, politic a little bit. Instead, you know, you do have to listen. Yes. Um, but then you have to act. This is right. the way we're going to do it. And then you just carry that out. So you have to be very clear in your communication of this is what we're doing. And then you carry it out. Now, what I love about Deborah is almost everything. But what the other thing is here in Judges 5 where, okay, we've won the battle. JL has, you know, done her thing with a tip peg. And then, uh, and now Barack who was the hesitant leader, you know, Deborah mm -hmm. had to kind of convince him. Okay. But now in Judges 5, we see it's Deborah who is affirming him. And she's like, hero, kings, and princes, you know, let's make melody to the Lord. For he went down to see her and he accomplished the battle. And then she goes on and she goes on and she gives credit to Jael in verse 6. She gives credit um, to Barak in verses 12 through 15. She gives credit to her whole team. She sings a whole song, you know. Now, she could have easily said, if it weren't for me, none of this would have happened, yeah. you know. Yeah. But she doesn't say that. She credits her whole team. Then she goes on, and she, and she acknowledges all the minor players here. She recounts all of the other tribes who joined them in the fight. She lists all them. And then she talks about JL being the most blessed among women again. And so here's the thing is that after we accomplish the task, then our job as leaders really begins. The, the project is never the thing. The project is what the Lord is using to develop leadership in mm. people. That's and great. that's his goal, right? He wants us to be perfect and refined you know, before him in heaven. And so he's got to use these crises as we see them, these battles, these challenges. He has to use those to glorify himself by, by refining us. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 4, where it says, um, the reason that you suffer, tri suffer tribulation is so that you can then comfort others who are suffering as well. And so I think that is how a true leader operates. It's like, yes, I've got to make this decision. I've got to get on with the task. 
so that I can affirm you for the next task that the Lord has for you. Well, again, it shows that that level of leadership that says uh, it's twofold. We get the task accomplished, but we can't do the task and accomplish the task without the people. And now you've brought the, I'll say it again, now you've brought the virtue of humility back into it. I don't bang on my chest and say, look, I'm the one who did this. I bang on my chest and say, look at who who actually did do this. And you put that encouragement back out there that, you know, people follow leaders. If the leader takes all the credit, nobody wants to follow that leader. <laughs> no, that's right. And, and you know, Mark, I, I think I might have mentioned this the other night um, or, or it was before whenever we did our conference that John Maxwell says, um, if you're a leader that's lonely at the top, uh, you need to recheck your leadership because a leader <laughs> takes people with him. Yes. You know, I I build teams of people. Teams get credit. All of these teams of fighters here in, in Judges 5 got the credit. And so it shouldn't be lonely at the top. You know, we should have brought our team with us yes. to get, to share in the glory and the credit. Great point. Let me drop one last question on you. Maybe this is diving really into the personal, but you've been you've been nothing but personal with us at all the different opportunities we've given to you. And your your enthusiasm for this topic, obviously it's something you're passionate about. But let me let me make this personal with you. So how has the Lord reshaped your life by having you delve into the leadership of Deborah? How has his his introduction of Deborah into your life, how has that shaped and molded you? Oh, that's so great. Um, well, you know, as I as I mentioned, um, I was uh, I, my, my mother died whenever I was very young. And so basically I was raised by my dad and um, I. I've mentioned him as my role model for leadership, you know, off and on and that kind of thing. And, um, and so he always really, you know, like centered me into this isn't, um, you know, a, a hero. This is a leader. Mm -hmm. Get to know that person as the leader. And so I mentioned that whenever I started with Deborah and I looked at her like, you know, some Amazon queen. And I really like took that into my mind and like, let's get to know this woman. And mm -hmm. so like for days I, I reread and I reread just the scripture before I went to the commentaries about what does the word tell me about her? So like the other night I went like through her place, her home, her time period, you know, like really getting into who is this woman I'm, I'm trying to study and perhaps emulate. And I, and I see that she's unique in time. She's the third of the judges. Um, she's unique in a place uh, because this, this battle that she's going to fight is also the side of Mount Carmel where, you know, Elijah's going to fight off his, you know, the, all those guys that they have. Um, that everything that, we know about her is very significant that the Lord like groomed her to be like a stand up and pay attention to this mm -hmm. kind of leader. And it really made me in several days I journaled about this, like what has the Lord done in my life that I've just blown away that I've just like glossed over? Like that can't be very important. Like the number three, that she would be the number three judge. I mean, you know, maybe we would just blow that over, except that we now know the significance of three and yeah, and those kinds of things, her place, um, who her husband was, that he was renowned. We see from Josephus, he was a renowned leader. Yeah. So she hadn't done anything as a young woman to discredit her husband. Yeah, that's a real note to those of us that were, um, as we're known in the South, strong women, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, as young wives, you know, we've yes. got to be very careful about how we do that, about how we lead with winsomeness and love. Um, and so that's, that's one of the reasons I adore her so much is because I see that she had, it seems to me, probably the same struggles that I had as a young woman, as a pastor's wife from a very young age, 
you know, that we are tempted to be overly strong, overly overt in our leadership. Mm -hmm. And the Lord, again, it's that listening, 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 and just speaking his word. So, you know, that, and other than the fact that it says she danced before the Lord, I mean, I'm pretty sold there, so... (laughs) There's kind of an overarching theme to this. The world today says leaders, you you determine a leader by the actions that they take. You really placed it on a different platform, and that is we we should be determining leaders by how well they listen to the Lord. Correct. I agree. That's my my total platform. Because our actions, again are judged by the value of our society. So right now in this current Christian culture of 2020, um, if you said, well, Johnny's actions show that she is very pro-life because she gives to the organization. She does counseling at the uh, pregnancy assistance center. She, you know, does uh, some political work toward that end. If you if you judged me on my action, you would say that's my value. But if you know me, you'll know that life at all cost is my virtue. Hmm. That saving life from conception to natural death isn't something I believe. It's something that I am. Yeah. And that's that's my virtue. And so that makes all the difference in the world. I may mess up in my actions. I may vote for the wrong candidate. You know, I may not show up for a political rally or something that I should. And so then if you're judging me on my actions and you say that determines my value, I'm going to miss the mark. I'm going to disappoint you. But if I'm listening to the Lord and I'm living out of my virtue, then even if you don't understand my actions, you can trust me. Hmm. And I think that's the bottom line for all leaders. We have to be trusted. That's a great final word. Johnny, thank you so much for spending time with us. You have been you've been a wonderful breath of fresh air looking at this, the whole issue of leadership from a completely different perspective, but seeing that leadership is leadership. Principles, virtues, characteristics, values, um, it, it's not gender specific. And I love that we've had a, a wonderful time twice now to dive into the person of Deborah. And I want to thank you for your insight uh, and your freshness and just your, your uh, passion for this. It's been wonderful. Thank you all also for being a part of us here at Grace Cafe. You can find us on YouTube under Grace Cafe. Click on that little bell and subscribe with us so we can expand the readership and the listenership of this. We want to thank you for being a part of this. Our goal here at Grace Center is to continue to introduce people to the love of Jesus Christ, a love that cannot be lost and a love that cannot be earned. We want to thank you for spending time with us today. Look forward to seeing you the next time. Thanks for being with us here on Grace Cafe. Thanks.